You know, some people call me up and say, hey, how come we're not having as many seminars as normal? Well, it takes a lot of effort on our part to put it together. You know, all the books you have, we print. So Pierre counted books wrong. Who can blame Pierre? He paid zero. He lost a lot. You know, and what our fault? The Pierre's been out with an injury. So for him to even come by and help us is a real, real big help. And all of you guys that just come out and make this thing work, I really appreciate it. So a round for you. Plus, we have the big help from this man standing to my left, Pete Meyer, and you call him my partner in crime. We do a bunch of stuff together, of course, many different webcasts. Hopefully, you're also reading Motor Age magazine and all this guy Twitters and does every other damn thing and how he has time to do it. But he's pretty amazing and has been a big help and supporter of PSD as well, even to get his magazine to look at us and partner up with us on many different things. So a round of applause. For you guys. And, and with that, I feel generous. I want to give some money out before you go. <laughs> Please. Okay? Oh, absolutely. So I don't know where the lead is, but I'm going to pull some money out. We're going to give some money away, a bunch of different $20 picks. So can I have someone up here with tickets? Where's Neil? Over here. Oh, you still doing tickets? Are we ready to cut some out? Or should I put Pete on first and we'll do that? Okay. Because I want everyone to have a fair chance, all the tickets that were sold. So let's go, no further ado, Mike. Thank you. Springtime in New York. I actually flew in a couple of days ago, and when I got to the hotel front desk, the young lady said, hey, welcome first day of spring. And I'm going, like, you're kidding, right? <laughs> I guess it depends on what part of the country you're from of what warm is, and I gotta tell you, this ain't it. <laughs> um, it's always a pleasure to come to the big event. It's been my pleasure to work with the G and the gang at TST for over three years now. A lot of things that we were able to accomplish uh, digitally online, the webinars and so forth, we couldn't have done uh, without you know, these guys. So uh, I know we give them a round of applause. I won't trouble you with that again, but. You know, I want you to know that we do appreciate G and his team a whole, whole lot. Uh, today, I'm going to try to make this fairly quick. I know everybody's getting hungry, wants to get to lunch. Uh, but I want to share something that's kind of been a personal bug of mine here now for the last few months. Uh, I've been in this business 40 years, man and boy. Uh, spent nearly all of that time under a hood. You know, I've got the scarred knuckles and the bad back and weak knees and all the rest that goes with that. And it seems to me that whenever we have events like this and we all get together and start talking, we invariably start talking about the same kind of challenges that face us as an industry. Uh, recently, Scott Brown and the team at IATN at uh, Vision uh, broadcast an educators think tank panel that kind of uh, got us going <laughs> near the end. Um, and one of the things that got me it, uh, really up on this subject was the term that I hear over and over again in these discussions when we say, the industry this, the industry doesn't do that, you know, the industry needs to do this. Well, you know what? Take a look around the room. You're the industry. And you're the industry. And you're the industry. We're the industry. We're a grassroots business. How many shop owners here? Okay, my hat's off to you guys. That takes cojones to get out there and put everything on the line and start your own business. And it's the same qualities that made you guys successful that are also hindering us as a whole. And what I mean by that is your business succeeded because you're strong-willed, you're independent, you have that free spirit, you have that entrepreneurial drive. You wanna do things your way. But there are a lot of elements in our industry that, as a whole, are doing things their way that aren't necessarily the right way, or the ethical way, or the professional way. Would you agree? And that impacts all of us. Okay? So that's kind of where I'm going to go with this. And I want to share some information with you so you know where I'm, where I'm headed. Anybody remember that, night, that game, the pickup sticks? You know? Well, these same issues that we've been talking about for as long as I can remember, 
is like that game of pickup sticks. When they started off, they were fairly easy to deal with, but now they've been allowed to fester and grow into a situation where you can't talk about one without worrying about all the others. You know, they're, they're all intertwined now. You guys are the exception because you're here. You're a very small part, though, of our overall industry. So let me share just a few numbers with you. I apologize I don't have the slides to go with it. My fault. All set up as a Mac and trying to run it on Windows, but that's okay. We don't need that. These list statistics I'm going to share with you are from the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, the Occupational Handbook uh, from 2012. Any teachers present? Okay, so you guys know what that is, right? That's the figures that we use to attract students about the opportunities in our field. And according to the 2012 statistics, the number of job opportunities in 2012 in the automotive repair field was 701,000. Now, if you've been to any events here, TST, Vision, even the big shows like Apex and SEMA, we're not getting 700,000 attendees, right? What that statistic doesn't share with you, though, is that that's down almost 50,000 jobs from the report issued two years prior. So there were fewer jobs than there were back in 2010. Why? Well, a big part of that was, of course, the recession that we had in 08. And the good news is that we are recovering as an industry. According to that same report, we're looking at about a 9% annual growth. So over the next decade, we're looking to add about 60,000 job openings or needs here in our industry, needs that we'll have to fill. Here's another little interesting statistic in the Bureau of Labor uh, Handbook. And it really struck me because I'm amazed to this day of how many people in the industry, and I mean CEOs, OEM reps, people that should be in the know, who think that we're all making a fortune working on cars, right? How many in this room, and I know there's a, probably a few, that are making six figures a year or more? Raise your hand. Okay, so we, I know we have a few. Now, as techs or as business owners, I'm talking about techs, flat rate. Okay, that's what I thought. I never made that kind of money. The median income, here's the news for you, the median income, according to the 2012 report for technicians, was $36,610. Wow. Now what is median income? Well, that means half made more, half made less, right? To give it a little broader uh, spectrum, the middle 50%, the 25th to the 75th percentile, made between 31 and 41,000 a year. Uh, only the top 10% made over 45. Interesting statistics. Bear with me, there's some more to come. Uh, in a separate report that I was able to locate online, I also found out that our industry, right now, 47% of the technicians in the field are 45 years old or older. Uh, let's do a little straw poll here. 45 and older? Okay. The next biggest segment of that, uh, of our market, 44%, uh, 25 to 44. And I kind of think my gut tells me there's a lot more 44s than 25s in that group. So if you're in the 25 to 44 group, raise your hand. Okay, now keep your hands up. If you're from 35 to 44, keep your hands up. Okay, so about, about right. Hmm. How many of you have seen the headlines of the impending technician shortage? Right? If you Google that, and I did, you'll see those same headlines going back as far as 20 years ago. So it's always been there. It's always been the seed in someone's mind that this impending shortage. Is there really an impending shortage? Well, remember the number I gave you earlier about the 60,000 job growth in the next decade? Further in that same report, when they give you the projected job openings as a separate statistic, the Bureau of Labor estimates that within the next 10 years, there will be a total of nearly 240,000 job openings in our industry. Now, wait a minute. 60,000 by growth. 
Where did the other 180 come from? 180,000 come from? Right? Well, what did we just say? Over nearly half of us are 45 years or older. Okay. Now, there you go. So I'm going to send it back. But the older techs are leaving the business. You know, sometimes it's from retirement. Sometimes it's because we shift over to the side. Maybe we go take a job as a service advisor or open our own business or, or go into teaching or whatever, or even in a whole different career field. But we're not in the bays anymore. And that's where the openings are coming from. Does that mean we're having a technician shortage? Well, I'll get to that in a moment. But one thing I want you to consider, though, even if we were able to swap body for body to cover the attrition, what else are we losing? Knowledge, experience. You know, no offense to the teachers and the students in the room, but the best student out of the best two-year program is not going to be the equivalent of a good 20-year experienced technician. You guys, you guys cannot be replaced by somebody fresh out of school, okay? So let's keep that in mind. Now, you know, I've said this here before, I'll say it again. Let's just assume that all of those 700,000 positions are currently filled. I don't think there's anyone in this room that would disagree that there are those in that group that should be doing something else for the betterment of all of us, okay? So that's certainly one issue. Uh, I think you'll also agree that cars are not getting any easier. So the need for those technicians, both now and going forward, to have those critical thinking skills is becoming even more and more important, right? Um, autonomous driving, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with news on that, but the DOT is close to <coughs> rulemaking requiring autonomous driving technology in new car platforms. And I think you'll see that in the next four to five years. Okay. And that's just one. Blind spot monitoring, collision avoidance, automatic braking. These are things that cannot be fixed partially. Right? Okay. All right, let's do a little math based on what I've, I've told you so far. Remember I said there's about 240,000 projected job openings over the next 10 years. That's um, 24,000 a year. We'll just keep the numbers right. Now again, the, t the teachers in the room. Okay, I want you to know that um, you guys are doing a good job. You're graduating nationwide an average of 33,000 students a year. And from what I found, those numbers are pretty consistent over the last five or six years. So no problem, right? 24,000 openings, 33,000 grads. That leaves we take the top two thirds and you know, the rest can go to McDonald's. And we're all right, right? Yeah, not necessarily. We already discussed the fact that we're losing experience is one factor, right? But here's the other factor. Of those 33,000 kids that graduate from automotive repair programs, not all of them come into our business. There are over 300,000 skilled technical jobs in this country right now that pay really good and there's nobody to fill them. There's that much of a shortage of kids into that program. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on, t on too. But back to the automotive side. So some of those 33,000, they're not even gonna come into the business. Uh, I met an instructor uh, at another event earlier this year, and they have a great automotive program at his school. But as an example, Clark Forklift came to him. And he says, um, we need techs, and we, will, we want you to set up a program with us and we'll give you everything you need in support of that program. And they did. Clark is hiring every tech they graduate, paying for their tools, giving them benefits, and starting them at $18 an hour. Not a flat rate hour, clock hour. What are we giving our kids? Spent two years in the program, spend money to go to that program, good money, and then they get hired in the field and they're gophers for minimum wage. They're cleaning the bathrooms and taking out the garbage. Master techs are using them as, you know, go fetch this or go do that. 
and they can't support their families or themselves. I want to tell you something. In the 40 years that I worked as a technician, I never, well, once, but I never left the shop because I didn't like the boss or I didn't like the coworkers, or even because I didn't like the working conditions. <laughs> I've worked in some real dumps. The main thing I came down to was I can't support my family on the work that's coming in the door. You know, if your shop is dry by 11 or 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and I've worked in a number of them, and I'm supposed to hang around and wait for something to come in to do? No. As much as I might like you, I've got to go somewhere else. So we bring the kids into the field. Is it any wonder then that those few that do enter our business, 60% of them leave in the first year? Is there an impending shortage? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When will it start to hit? I don't know. But I'll be honest with you, I really believe that unless some things start to change, for the consumer, it won't be a matter of how much it costs to get my car fixed, it's when. How long do I have to wait before there's an opening at the shop? because there aren't that many places to get it done. There aren't that many trained personnel to get it done. So much for all the bad news. What can we do to change it? Well, I think it's a, a, a few things that come to mind. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I will tell you this, though. There's a lot of organizations, and we all heard of them, they all have these multi-alphanumeric designations Right? There's ASA, there's AAIA, there's ASE, there's NATEF, there's, I mean, you know, there's a lot of them out there. And I think that even right now, there's somebody sitting at a desk somewhere, either setting up a new study or forming a committee or putting together a survey or opinion poll to discuss or challenge or find out about what we're talking about. And then it stops there. Why? Because we don't want to be told what to do. We want to head our own way. But as I said earlier, we can't fault that mythical entity, the industry, because there is no such thing. You're looking at it. We're it. Anything that's going to change is going to have to start here, in this room, with you, with me, with these guys. What can we do? I think there are a few challenges that we can pinpoint right off. Number one is the image of our industry by the consumer. The consumer is the parent of the child who's considering an automotive career. And you know what they're telling them? Oh, you don't want to be a mechanic, right? We don't have the best image, do we? How many times you introduce yourself to someone at a social event, they ask you what you do. I'm a mechanic. Oh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Right? Until they need you. And then they want you to fix the car for them for free. Check this for free. Well, the guy down the street will do it. Okay. So this is the same mindset that we have to change. Now, is their view inaccurate? No, again, keep in mind, you guys here and ladies, you're the exceptions in our industry. You're the ones who are taking the time to get the training that you need, to keep up with your, 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 the challenges facing you uh, in the uh, repair business. You're the, the, that 20% that cares about the professionalism. There's a whole lot more of them out there that don't. Am I lying? You guys know them. You know the shops are in your own hometowns, right? That you would like to see out of business for whatever reason. Okay. Well, we can't go around, you know, hanging those guys. Not the old West, but we can go home and do something a little bit different to help change that image with that consumer. You guys are I'm probably preaching to the choir. But, you know, if you're a tech and you're in the back and your shirt tail's hanging out and the cigarette's dangling from your mouth when you go to talk to your customer, you might want to change that. You know, if you're one of those guys that, hey, we've all done it, I'm really tired, it's been a long day, and I'm just going to shotgun a part of this last car of the day, so hope that takes care of it and send them on their way. Well, we don't do that anymore. The little things, the little things that you can do. To even more, what? April's Car Care Wear Month, right? Maybe you should hold an event. Show your community what a professional shop looks like, how they act. You know, get involved. I know it's hard. There are other things on your table that you need to be done. But if we don't individually take responsibility for our industry, things are not going to change. And they're going to continue to get worse until it does land on your front door. 
The second thing I would say, we can't change this next issue until we address the first. We can't pay living wages to all of our technicians unless we can justify to the consumers that we're worth that kind of money, right? A lot of you have already done that in your own little markets. You know, I know shops that have no qualms charging way more than their competition, but their customers know they're worth it. They've won that little part of the battle. But I would say to you guys that are hiring these kids starting off, understand that they're just on another product on your shelf. And I've been to the management classes where that's exactly what they think of techs. Hey, am I, again, am I lying? Have you, you've been to those, right? He's just another part on the shelf. Now, you guys, the local shops, smaller shops, you don't feel that way because you're right there with your guys every day. But do you think the, oh, I don't even know I should say it, I'd probably get politically incorrect here. Let's just say the discount chains, they don't feel that way. You know, their employees are just another product of inventory. And especially the young men. When you take, or a young lady for that matter, when you take on a young tech, consider that you're farming that kid, you're mentoring that kid. He's in a, treat him like an apprentice instead of just another <coughs> newbie. Bring him along, challenge the skills that he spent all that time and energy learning in school. Which leads me to the third part. Maybe that kid you got doesn't have the skills that he should have had when he got out of school. Well, you can change that too. Trainers, teachers, raise your hands again. You get a chance to check with these guys that raise their hands once you're in charge of teaching our next generation. Ask them how you can become involved in their advisory councils. They'd love to have you. And it's not that tough a job. You meet maybe three, four times a year, but you get to have input on what their programs are teaching, how well they're doing, what they need to do more of, what they need to do less of. And the other thing that comes into play, if I'm a shop owner, that's my farm team. That's my AAA. I'm gonna be watching these kids as they develop. I'm looking for the ones that are sharp. Because I want them working for me. I want to take them along and bring them along. It's laying there right in your own backyard. Does it take time? Yes. Educators, hey, I've done that. I know the challenges and I appreciate what you do but sometimes it's too easy to stay in the classroom. Same applies to you guys. You gotta get out. You gotta go meet the shops in your area. You gotta go show them what you're doing. Have an open house. Get the word out. Show them the, 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 uh, what's there for them, the resources that are there for them. Okay. You know, again, I don't promise to have all the answers. We try what we do you know, at the magazine to support educators support you guys, provide the resources that we can so that you can do what you need to do and get the job done. Uh, again, we know, I know, what it takes to make a living in this business. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But together, we can rise to the challenges that are facing us. Together, we can quit complaining and moaning about them. And together, we can go home and make that one little change that makes our industry better for it. And that's what I'm going to leave you with before we go to lunch. I want to challenge each and every one of you. Go back to your shops on Monday. Go back to your communities on Monday. Do that one thing that's going to have a positive influence on the industry as a whole. And we can make the difference. Thank you. Well, thank you.